Hi guys, we're back. We're back at uh, for Sifu Weld's uh, podcast called Beyond Kicking and Punching. I'm so excited for this one because we get to meet and talk and listen to Jason Scott Jones, who is a martial artist, a film producer, an author, activist, and a human rights uh, worker. So. You know, when it comes down to it, guys, it, it, we all need to care about each other and help each other out. And this man is actually putting more than just words behind his uh, action, you could say. He's actually putting some action. He's putting everything into it through films, through actually going to these places and helping people out. And it's something I believe we should all uh, learn from and hopefully start doing a little bit more of because if we all do something about it, we'll have a better world, I believe. So again, let me turn it over to Sifu Aldacascos first. And then after that, we'll have Jason Scott Jones and then we'll take it from there. Again, folks, keep yourselves muted. You can keep your video on so that this way we can get you guys uh, going a little bit better. There we go. So, Sifuwal, thank you for joining in. Okay, I'm all ready to go. Hey guys, listen here. Um, this has been recorded here from Texas and from Hawaii and up in Winnipeg, Canada, where it's really, really cool and I'm Sure, glad I'm not up there. I'm here in Hawaii, sunny Hawaii, which is supposed to be sunny, but you know, we've been having a lot of rain and wind. But listen up, we're going to have a lot of fun today. Um, and I hope that you enjoy this program here because, man, I'm super stoked on having Jason Jones with us. Um, I think I met Jason Jones about a year ago, a year and a half ago. I don't know when, but it was really an odd way that we met. And, um, and naturally, I'll let him let, let, let you know how we met. Uh, but uh, it's uh, the reason why I have him is because I've been really interested into knowing what he's been doing and before I met him, you know, and also where, where he's up to at this stage of the game. And um, as you know, we go, this, our, our topic is, you know, beyond kicking and punching. And there's a lot of times when people get into the martial arts, you know, they, they hit a, they hit a pick, pick in their life and they just, for them, especially when they get to be a black belt, there's no life for them after black belt, but there is so much things going on, you know, on why a person, a person, you know, become such a good individual serving the community, using the martial arts as a vehicle to move on. And this is what really interests me because I've seen people, you know, um, use the martial arts in a very progressive way to really serve the community, serve themselves, serve their family, serve their loved ones, and go beyond, on and beyond. Of course, you know, that's 99.9% .9 of the people, but then you still got the little bit of people that, you know, that you kind of regret that you ever taught martial arts because they go on the other spectrum. But the majority of the people use the martial arts for incredible things, you know? It doesn't matter whether it's gonna be, you know, uh, uh, jujitsu or, or Aikido or boxing or MMA or whatever. You meet individuals that have used their martial arts to progress themselves in their lives. And I wanna know how to get there. What is the motivative uh, thing that brings them there? You know, what, what kind of inspiration can they give us? And every time I hear somebody that's been in the martial arts do something great, you know, it, it, it makes me much more younger. It gives me more energy because it gives life. So, you know, meeting Jason Jones, it's been an incredible mental and spiritual journey for me because I've, I've, I've read some of the things he's done and I've, I've watched his videos. And, and lately I just finished uh, looking at his movie that he produced called Divide, Divided Hearts of America. I mean, that thing really punches you in the gut. So we're gonna be talking about a lot of things, you know, and um, I wanna welcome Jason um, uh, uh, to the program here. And I'm sure that uh, <laughs> we can go both ways. We both ins inspire and motivate each other. But 
Um, I don't, I don't want to ask a question to Jason, you know, um, and this comes up with a lot of people that also has been asking, well, who is he? You know, what has he done? Okay, there's a lot of people that know him because he's, he's been out there. He's spoken to, to conferences where there have been thousands of people in it. He's been to a lot of countries doing his, his uh, presentation and so forth, but there's people that haven't. But so let's start from the people that don't know. So, hey, Jason, are you ready? So the I'm question here, Sifu. <laughs> okay, Jason, the question is exactly, you know, I don't know, we, we, we're going we're gonna to skip the age part. We don't need to know about the age or anything that way, okay? Um, the thing that, uh, you know, you told me a little bit about you and why you got started, but that was for me. Now, can you tell people exactly how you started into the martial arts? Yeah, you know, like, well, first of all, it's a privilege to be on, on your show and with your tribe, our tribe, but this is really uh, your, 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 you're the chief of this tribe. And um, you're someone I looked up to as a boy. I mean, from my very earliest years. And so to be on your program is a real privilege. In fact, this is a book that was like my Bible as a child. I don't know if you guys can see it. Um, uh, this classic martial arts book. And I'd carry it with me and I would just gaze at it and stare at it and read about all the martial arts. And look at this handsome fellow right there. <laughs> you recognize that guy? Yeah, so, that's why I had a lot of hair, huh? <laughs> yeah, and when you would be on the cover with your wife of uh, Inside Kung Fu and Black Belt Matt, th those were my favorite covers. And I think it goes with well, why, why you and your, your wife being partners, your ex-wife to me meant so much as I, I was, my mother had me when she was 16. My father went off to the military and I really didn't get to know him until I was, he didn't come back until I was about seven. And I lived in a very violent home. Um, and especially in my early years. And even to pre-memory, I just was always wanting to be strong. My first memory is, I, I don't want to, you know, uh, speak ill of anyone in my family, but was someone I loved in my family being beaten up. It's my earliest memory, just my covered in blood and I, I was like two and I tried to call 911. I picked up the phone to call the police but I didn't even know how to use a phone and I felt helpless. So I always wanted to be strong and I always wanted to be the toughest kid in the neighborhood. And always, I fell in love with Kung Fu movies through the Shaw Brother films and films like, um, you know, Drunken Master or Lone Wolf and the Cub any film that had a, a, a boy with a strong male figure was attractive to me. And I would, I would wait for certain films. In those days, the Kung Fu movies were on, that, there were the two dials. And there was the one dial with like 30 channels and there'd be Kung Fu movies on some of those channels and there'd be Kung Fu theater. There were certain films that I always couldn't wait to come back on. And they all had the same theme as I reflected as an adult on the ones that I loved. The, the theme was, a boy that was weak, that was powerless, that was alone. And he got a mentor, a strong male role model, got a girlfriend, got a community and became a strong man and defended his mother, his family, his community. And so I think that was sort of the myth. Those, that mythos is what attracted me to the martial arts. And it was in the fourth grade when a kid, I remember his name, Brian White, had a black belt magazine. And I eventually bought the very magazine he gave me in the fourth grade on eBay, it was this magazine. And um, this magazine was like it until I could sell enough bottles to get new Black Belt magazines and new Inside <laughs> Kung Fu magazines. And um, so that's when I fell in love with martial arts. But my mother didn't have a lot of money and she, she, you know, she was a waitress and she had, by this time, I think we had four kids. Um, and she really couldn't sign me up for martial arts but eventually in, in, in uh, late in the fourth grade, I started in judo, but then she couldn't afford it. So I do judo for six months and then she'd take me out and then she'd put me in Kempo for six months. <clears throat> in those days, I'd be the student you wish you didn't teach because my six months of judo, every kid in the neighborhood was being concussed, thrown under their head or tripped. And, and then I'd take Kempo and then I started kicking everyone in the neighborhood and uh, just trying to, I guess we'd call it pressure test what I was learning but th that's really what, what um, is where my love for the martial arts began.
Mm. Oh, okay, that's that's cool. That's um, what state? Uh, what state do you come from? I mean, I'm really... from Chicago. Uh huh. And then what really set my hair on fire was on the channel that I'd watch inside. I, I'd watch uh, um, Kung Fu Theater as I saw a documentary from the '70s. Maybe you guys all remember. Um, and I heard a gentleman you were talking to when you thought you were muted earlier. And he had, had a background that I think fits a lot of us that were attracted to martial arts, especially in the 70s and 80s. Um, you know, our neighborhood was, was, was uh, a, a pretty tough neighborhood, but the documentary I saw that set my hair on fire was called Fighting Black Kings. And it was mm -hmm. about these guys, these black guys from New York that fought in Masoyama's first world tournament. And I watched that and I said, I'm gonna fight in that one day. And and that became my goal. And by God's grace, I had the privilege of fighting in the sixth world tournament representing the United States in Tokyo, Japan. What year so, was that? That was in 1995. Oh, wow. Oh, there I am. There you go. <laughs> look look at that, that long hair, man. You look like a real badass. <laughs> Looks can be deceiving. <laughs> yeah, well, no, no, you look super good in it. Um, you know, what the, what actually led you to Hawaii? Because you end up end up end up being here in Hawaii for about seventeen years. Thirty one years. Thirty one years. It's from when I was seventeen until just recently, and and you know I think of you often now since we've left. Hawaii is a part of my hero's journey in that, you know I was um, as to be expected with my background. I you know, I had some rocky. My youth was rocky, and I was a troubled youth. At 17, I ended up joining the army. Actually, the day I turned 17, I went to the recruiter's office. And oh. um, my father was in the Big Red One, so I requested Germany. But, but in the third grade, um, I saw an oil painting of Elite. And uh, I, I always wanted to go to Hawaii after that day. I knew I'm going to go to Hawaii one day. But I didn't know you could even go to Hawaii in the military. It wasn't something I understood. And through my love of martial arts, I knew about you and Bobby Lowe, and just all the great legends that came from Hawaii. So this dream of going to Hawaii one day was in my mind. And the, the, the uh, recruiter said, you know, Hawaii is available. I couldn't believe it. I said, yes. <laughs> and so at 17, I, I went to Hawaii. And, um, you know, I've been there uh, uh, because of the COVID shutdowns and the nature of my work traveling all the time. We had to make this very hard decision, at least for a time, to leave. And... Um, it was just a practical thing to do. So now we're on the mainland, but my heart is broken. You know, my heart is broken being away. And yeah, I think yeah. about all the years you spent away and I don't, I don't know how you did it. Well, I knew that I always would come back. You know, I mean, I was away for over 35 years, maybe 31 years, you know, outside, you know, but I always came back to Hawaii, no matter whether where I was in Germany or on the mainland, every year I came back and I could see the change because when I left Hawaii, um, back in 1965, there was only, the population was 500,000 people. You know, now it's what, pretty close to 1,400,000. So it's a lot. So this, uh, you know, population has gone up. Um, you know, I want to hit on this one here. What was your training like here in Hawaii? You know, I feel so privileged. Um, you know, I, I remember coming from the mainland, I didn't know what to expect. And that, you know, there was a lot of the martial arts I did had a, they had a very strict kind of formality to it. And I remember the first time I showed up at uh, Shihan Bobby Lo, uh, his dojo and Shihan Bobby Lo was Masoyama's first school actually was the Hawaii school because he was traveling uh -huh. uh, in the early fifties. And so Bobby Lo uh, uh, trained with him. He trained with James Mitosi as well. And, and then went on to train with Masoyama but it was very informal. Um, you know, it, it had some formality to it, of course, being Kyokushin. But, but what I remember most about it was, is it was very much a Kumite school. It was all about fighting. And there were just these legends like uh, Ikihara Sensei and Oyama Sensei. Um, and what they would do is when the regular folks, the moms and the kids would train with us, then they would leave, then the doors would shut. And when the doors would shut, the tables would go up and the cores light and the poke and sashimi would come out and the, the, the old guys would eat and drink while we would beat the smack out of each other to all hours of the night. Mm -hmm. And of course, I don't think that could happen today. And those were just such beautiful days. And then we would sometimes, Shihan would say, get in the cars and we would just drive to another dojo and 
we would fight or other schools would show up at um, our dojo and we would spar all very hard sparring, but also very respectful. And uh, nothing macho about it at all. You know that they had talked to each other beforehand and said, okay, let's have you guys come over. And, and, um, and then every once in a while, they would, you know, they would ask you to go out with them for drinks or something. Uh, and that was very, very special. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some guys ask, you know, how did you and I meet? How, what was the circumstance that led up to you and I meeting? You know? It's very strange. I was selling a, I think a futon or something from my or bed from my son's room. And one of your students came to pick it up. And then when he grabbed it, my kids, as hard as I try to get them involved in martial arts, they're not, but they get everything I wish I had. So there are all these weapons under my son's bed, right? <laughs> and my wife, I hear my wife apologize. Go, oh, my, my husband's nuts. He gives those to my children. Um, and he said, oh, oh that's okay. Uh, I, I'm, I train the martial arts as well. And then I, I heard that and I went in. I said, who do you train with? And he, and he said, Alda Koskis. I said, isn't he in Germany or something? And he goes, no, he's here. And I said, could I meet him? And we just started talking. And he said that, that they want to have a movie project. I said, I'm a filmmaker. And yeah, it was such a great day when me and my boys walked across um, the park uh, under Diamond Head to, to, to meet you. Is, and that's the, the great thing about Hawaii. I think, I don't know how many people know that it's the home of so many martial arts legends. So to be able to meet you and get to know you uh, was, was a great privilege for me and to have my boys meet you. Because you and your friends here, I mean, I, I don't know if they realize, um, especially your generation, because there was this great cultural shift and maybe the first, those first generations were where home, the family was breaking apart and there were all these great social changes and, and boys were just lost. And martial arts were like that rope that we grabbed on to not fall into the abyss. And your example and, um, you know, magazines like this, this is, this is what, where we, we wanted to be good men, strong men, we didn't know how. And so to meet you as someone who I really looked up to uh, and that you trained with your wife, my parents were never married. That was something that really always attracted me. I was like, whoa, a family of martial artists. Like that's my dream, oh. uh, which I still don't have because my kids swim, my wife plays tennis and I got elbowed in the face all alone at Muay Thai yesterday. They don't come with me, but uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was just a great honor to, to meet you. Well, that's great. Well, we got a little bit of uh, experience on your martial arts side. I'm sure there's going to be more of that as we talk long. Now, I'm going to shift into another subject here because, um, you know, um, you're, you're, you're into human rights uh, and being an activist in that. And then, you know, we were talking yesterday about the race to save our century, which um, you have that five principles uh, to promote. What are they? Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, so, you know, as a young man, I, I, as, uh, I experienced a uh, horrible loss and an act of violence, which just sort of ordered my thinking as, as, a, as a young man. And then in my studies, I just decided I wanted to spend the rest of my life getting in between the vulnerable and the violent. It wasn't until even recently that I was able to connect my love for the martial arts, my youth, my childhood, and sort of my vocation uh, in human rights work and as a filmmaker. Um, but as a 20, I guess when I was at the University of Hawaii after I was in the military, I, um, I wanted to know, you know, what were the causes of genocide, democide, and total war in the 20th century? Because I saw that we were careening towards a repeat. And now with 3 million Uyghurs in concentration camps, the brutal genocides that Iraq and Syria just experienced, um, you know, I kind of saw this all coming in the mid 90s. And so the five principles that I so starting in the 90s, I said, what are those principles that we can advocate to make sure that we don't have a repeat? Um, and so I've sort of boiled it down to five key principles. One is, if we had a culture that acknowledged the incomparable dignity of every human person that if um, we acknowledge that every human being from the moment of the, their biological beginning, through their natural death, regardless of race or ethnicity or cognitive ability or health, 
that they all had an inviolable dignity. That's number one. And when we look at the ideology of the 20th century that led to the great genocides, they began attacking the human person at the margins. Um, and so we should, we should promote the inviolable dignity of the human person regardless. Um, number two is the transcendent moral order. And we acknowledge there's a law above legislatures, pop culture, public opinion polls, uh, and that we should try to correspond, uh, work to make sure our laws correspond. As, as the Reverend Martin Luther King used to say, that we would want man's laws to conform to God's will. Uh, and I think that's an, another way of saying that is just there's a law above opinion. There's a law above power. And we should try to understand that law. And, and at its root, it's just a thoughtfulness to the vulnerable. And then three would be subsidiarity. Now I'm getting kind of wonky. But if you look at the great crimes of the 20th century, they all were able to happen because um, they obliterated the free institutions of civil society between the person and the family and the state. So church, family, community associations, regional and local power, all power was pushed off to distant unelected bureaucracies. And that's how in, 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 in Germany or in the Soviet Union, such horrible crimes were, were, be, were committed even against the will of most, of most of the people. It's because power was taken out of people's hands and pushed off to distant bureaucracies. Um, four is a humane economy. That's a just social order is grounded in private property rights set within the commonwealth of the families and communities. And then five is solidarity. And solidarity is that we should all order our life around serving the vulnerable. And there's only two ways we really or you can order your life. You either um, kiss up or kiss down, right? You're, uh, you're either kneeling before the powerful or you're kneeling before the vulnerable. And, and it's the hard thing to do is to sacrifice and serve the vulnerable. But I think we should all order our, our lives and we should work to have of community associations, non-governmental associations, and even our government should be ordered to serve the vulnerable rather than pow the powerful. The powerful can take care of themselves. And then those are my five principles. And wow. everything I do, whether it's my movies or my articles or my books, it all has that same line of gesture, which I say is we do one thing two ways. We defend the vulnerable from violence by telling the truth about the human person and by inspiring solidarity with the vulnerable. Hmm. You've uh, also were involved in the politics in Hawaii in the legislators, um, you know, realm, um, pushing for the um, Uyghurs, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I've been one of the leading activists for, for, with the Uyghur. Uh, we work my, through my organization, the Vulnerable People Project. We seek to- uh, uh, Jason, before we be, be, Jason, before we say, you know, I, I mentioned the word Uyghurs, but I think a lot of people don't know who they are and what they are and what, what you know, give me a background on why why the Uyghurs. Yeah, the Uyghur are a beautiful people. They're an ethnic minority that are predominantly Muslim. They're a Turkic people in uh, their country is East Turkestan. It was invaded by China in 1949. And um, in the past, it's there have been acts of genocide against the Uyghur since 49, but it's really ramped up in the past, de less than the past decade. And uh, right now, it's, it's, uh, it's reached a point where there's 3 million Uyghur in concentration camps. I hate to even say what they're doing to the Uyghur, forced abortions, forced sterilization, organ harvesting. Um, DNA, they have had DNA and, 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 and um, uh, eye imprints of 80% of, of the population. Even those who aren't in prison are, are, in, are in concentration camps. The country is effectively one giant slave camp. Uh, and it's getting worse every day. So just yesterday, uh, through our work, the Hawaii State Legislature um, introduced a resolution that Hawaii would um, wants will be standing in solidarity with the Uyghur and not take products. They don't want to take products made by slave labor in China. There's a bill also in Congress. But we work with the Yazidis. I was so grateful. I had an article last week in Arabic in all the newspapers in Iraq uh, talking about the, the Yazidis and the Christians in the Nineveh Plains. So that's what we seek to do. A lot of these groups like, you know, the Yazidis in Iraq, the proto-Semitic people who's had the misfortune of being smack dab in the middle of a country that's very rich in resources that all the powers in the world collide 
uh, in Iraq, and no one is thoughtful to the interests of the Yazidis. And the Yazidi community is poor, and they wouldn't begin to know how to influence the media or, or politicians in the United States. That's where we come in, and we show them how to. The American people are beautiful people, and they would, of course, want to side with the vulnerable against the powerful, but they don't even know they exist. And that's where we step in and say, let's get your voice heard. Let's tell the world your story. And that's, so that's what my organization does. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, what's the position now of the Uyghurs? I mean, um, where, 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 where do we go from here with them? Sifu, thank you for asking about them. You know, I'm very hopeful, just like most Americans, when they find out what's happening to the Uyghur are repulsed. Most Chinese, most Han Chinese in China would be horrified to know what's happening to the Uyghur. They just don't know. Uh, and we have two big opportunities this year. We have US-China trade negotiations, which are about to happen. This is a great opportunity to um, make sure that American corporations like Apple and Coca-Cola and Costco uh, and Nike and many others that are using uh, contractors that use Uyghur slave labor, that that stops. And once it costs the, uh, the CCP money to run slave camps, they'll open them. As long as they're profiting from running slave camps, they'll keep them. So I think the China-US trade negotiations are a great opportunity and the Olympics. The Olympics are a great opportunity. Uh, by God's grace, they're going to be in China or not. And I think the world community needs to say, if you want the Olympics, you need to release the 3 million innocent human beings you have in concentration camps. So I see this as a great opportunity. I'm a Catholic. Pope Francis was absolutely silent on the genocides in Iraq. He went to Iraq last week and apologized for his silence. And so I hope he means it. He has not said a single word about the, the, the Uyghur. I think that he is in a very powerful position. So I have an op-ed, I think coming out in Newsweek this week, uh, um, asking, saying that Pope Francis has a real opportunity here to um, lead a, in defense of the Uyghur where he fell down and failed in defense of the minorities in Iraq um, during the ISIS uh, horrors that we saw with the Yazidis and others. Um, mm. That's yeah. great. Um, you know, your movie that recently came out, Divided Hearts of America, um, there's been a lot of questions about it. Yeah, you wanna to touch on that? Yeah, so um, some of my business partners uh, a couple of years ago, we knew that the 2020 election was going to be, uh, or the 2020 election would be very divisive and we'd be polarized as a country. So one of my partners was Elizabeth Kennedy Reisowitz. Her uncle is actually Justice Kennedy. Um, and Chad Bonham was one of the direct, is the director. So we're like, wouldn't it be great to do a movie that explored the roots of division in America? And um, we, we said, yeah, I said, you know, we agreed the only person that could pull it off is Benjamin Watson. Uh, Benjamin Watson was the uh, tight end for the Patriots until last year, but he's a very winsome guy and a very honest guy who's loved across the political spectrum. And he has this unique ability to speak on controversial things in a way where people listen, whether it's abortion or race. So we said, well, only if Benjamin Watson would do it. Well, we said, well, there's no way he'd agree to do it. So let's ask him if he says, when he says no, we'll shelve this idea. We asked him and lo and behold, he said, yes. So we, we made this film where he went on this great exploration of America, interviewing people across the political spectrum, people like Alveda King, Martin Luther King's niece, senators and politicians, Democrats, Republicans. And what he really came to understand is Amer America's unity is based on only one thing. And that is the declaration principle that we acknowledge that we share, we have uh, equal dignity, equal rights. It's actually embedded in the declaration principle where we don't share religion, ethnicity, um, not even culture in many cases, but what we share, what we agree to is that everyone has um, inalienable rights that are endowed to them by their creator, not by government. There have been three brutal denials of that founding principle. Even before the declaration of independence, we had the weed of slavery so when the founding fathers planted that wheat and many of them themselves didn't live up to the full meaning of that principle, many did like John Adams and George Mason. Um, 
but slavery from the beginning denied our founding principle. Then we had segregation and Benjamin Watson came to understand that abortion, Roe v. Wade likes segregation and slavery and actually was grounded in it because it was promoted by radical eugenicists and racists like Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, that those three denials of our founding principle have been at the source of all of our great division. And then if we wanna be united as a country, we really have to once and for all really mean it when we say we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and endowed by their creator with rights. Otherwise, tyranny is the only other option because there is no other bond for us. It's either we acknowledge our inviolable dignity, that we have an equal dignity um, that comes to us not from government, but is endowed to us by our creator, or we're going to have to um, see an end of our liberal constitutional republic, and it will change into some sort of uh, neoliberal dictatorship, which unfortunately it seems like we're, we're moving in that direction. Uh, but our movie ends also very hopeful. And I'm hopeful because evil is the deprivation. Ideologies of evil are deprivations that, um, that evil in itself doesn't exist. It's the absence of being. And so all of these ideologies of evil in the end die. Mm. You know, Hitler's thousand year Reich lasted 12 years. Mm. Uh, the Soviet Union lasted what, 71 years. So these totalitarian regimes or these ideologies that deny the truth about human nature inevitably will all collapse. Okay, but so you see- it can be a generation two, three or four, you know? Yeah, so and actually you see that we are talking about the pendulum effect where it goes from one swing of totalitarianism all the way up to the other side and back again. So where in this phase are we? You know, this cancel culture to me is very interesting. I always say the cancel culture is really the culture of death. It, it's cruel, it's thoughtless, it's vicious, it lacks sympathy, it lacks empathy, it lacks any concern for the truth or the full picture. Um, and I think we're seeing an end to it. Uh, generations get ambushed by technology, they get ambushed by, they, they, they get ambushed by technology, they get ambushed by history. So like the baby boomer generation, your generation was ambushed by the worst war the world had ever seen. It was jarring to your generation. Uh, a whole generation of, of, of children, fathers were shattered by the war. And if outside of America, if you're in Germany or Europe, I mean, your whole, your, your nation states and were shattered um, in ways we can't even as Americans begin to understand. And then, and then the new technologies that just fell on your generation, social media, in a way that's less obvious, I think has been as devastating to the, a human dignity as um, the ideology of the 20th century. Um, but now these, these Gen Zers, they completely react, re reject cancel culture. If you, the millennials have been absorbed by it, um, but the Gen Zers completely react against it. And you see across the ideological spectrum, people on the left, like Sam Harris, people who were on the left, like Dave Rubin, Hawaii's former Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard, Joe Rogan, martial artist, and, and I think the number one podcast in the world, they all reject this illiberal, I call it illiberalism. I say, you know, you put neo in front of anything, it equals illiberal, neo-conservative, illiberal, neo-liberal, illiberal, neo-Marxist, illiberal, neo-fascist, illiberal. And what, what I hope to promote is a true authentic liberalism that, that celebrates diversity, pluralism, and respect for others. Hmm. So I think the pendulum is coming back in the right direction. I tell all my friends that love this cancel culture, and I'm in Hollywood too, I work in Hollywood too. I have a lot of friends that, that cheer on cancel culture. I say, you are gonna wake up real soon on the wrong side of history. <laughs> you're gonna wake up real soon and you're gonna be really ashamed of yourself. You know, stop being cruel and, and um, yeah, so, but I guess I'm con politically conservative in Hollywood, so it's an advantage where I'm not being seduced, my natural inclinations aren't being, you know, s seduced. So I think for my friends on the left in Hollywood, it's, it's easier to be swept away. Um, but so many are not being swept away. And that's like people on the left, like Tulsi Gabbard, Dave Rubin, and Sam Harris, 
to see how uh, Tulsi Gabbard just had a great segment on uh, Tucker Carlson this week again against cancel culture. But to me, again, this is where it goes all back to the martial arts. You know, humility, um, the humility you get when you are constantly surrounded by very strong, confident people where you're getting your bell rung, you're tapping out all the time. It's hard to get full of yourself. And then you you fall in love. Like our martial arts tribe is people, we love people that we have different politics, different religions, um, but yet we're in the same tribe. We're, we're brothers and sisters and uh, we don't want to other them. We don't want to, you know, I do so much work in the Muslim world. And um, so some most of my closest friends that I've been in really stressful situations with and so when you're in, you know, very dangerous, stressful situations, you become very close with people and you learn how to really trust these people. And most of them are Muslims. And, um, and so, yeah, I think that our tribe is playing an important role, will play an important role in battling back these ideologies without us even knowing it. Uh, and you look at someone like Joe Rogan, who he, he's such an example of decency and thoughtfulness he has what I call the gift of admiration. Every guest he has on, he's like a little puppy dog. He's in love with his guests. He's like a little kid meeting his hero with every single guest. He has the art of seeing the greatness in others. He learned that as a lifelong martial artist, right? right. He thought he was the greatest guy in the world. He was a Taekwondo champion. And then he got on the, on, on the, on the mats. And he was getting choked out. And no matter how good you are, you're going to tap. And then you get to see everyone is great at this, someone's great at that. And you, you, once your ego is pushed down, then you can admire all the greatness around you. And so that's why I think your tribe Sifu is like the, the most important tribe. In fact, after the COVID shutdowns, uh, when I finally got to go back and train, I came back so happy. And I said to my wife, I said, if I was God to go to heaven, you'd have to train in the martial arts, something. <laughs> Like, I wouldn't let anyone in. Like, what, you know, St. Peter would be like, where did you train? What did you train? Oh, no, sorry, you didn't do martial arts, you can't come in. Because I was just so happy to be back there um, with, with my people. Yeah, you know, that's awesome you talk about, about that. Because, um, you know, there's this, you know, martial arts, like anything else, you know, you have a lot of people that have a lot of big egos. You know, I mean, it's so big as that they you know i've met people thinking that thinking that their particular style is the best in the world you know and they don't know how to put that ego outside the door and come in and train and if you can leave the ego outside and come in and train you'll find out that you know the person that mastered his own art is going to be a very hard person to beat anyway you know and that's showing humility humbleness and things this way and that's where you learn and and if you yourself are able to just put yourself, uh, put your ego outside and go out and get elbowed in the, on the temple, you know, that, <laughs> that means you are willing to take the, the, take the kick and punches as well as give it out, which is really tremendous. And I'm sure that while you were doing a lot of your, your, your film work, you know, you've met a lot of people also in that area that were a little bit really big egos, you know, uh, that uh, couldn't put and adjust themselves into it. Now, with that said, your martial arts, yeah, how, what would you say would be the greatest benefit in martial arts uh, to, uh, for people to move on forward? You mean, um, what do you mean, what do you mean, can you rephrase that question, Sifu? Like, what do I think is the greatest benefit for martial arts or? Yeah, I mean, you know, you learn martial arts, so what, uh, what, what is the benefit, the, the greatest, there can be tons of benefits that for sure. You know, um, but for you, what was the benefit that you learned from martial arts that made made it you made you move forward beyond kicking and punching? Well, I think you said move forward, and so my my martial art is Kyokushin. My my main martial art is Kyokushin, and I think if you think if one thing about Kyokushin, it's move forward. And I say that martial arts are secular; they're sacraments. So in the Catholic Church, a sacrament is a sign in time of a truth that's eternal. And martial arts is a sign, like when you go in the dojo, uh, it's a sign in a moment of how you're gonna live your life. And if you don't live your life in that moment the way you like, um, then you need to self-correct. For example, when I got elbowed yesterday in the head, um, I didn't have my mouthpiece or headgear on. And uh, the, <laughs> the coach was very clear, if, 
you don't have, they don't have mouthpiece, no elbows. But this guy elbowed me and I'm ashamed to say my immediate response was to elbow him very, very hard in return. I didn't like how I responded, you know? And so as I was driving home, I, I thought, you know, this guy just made a mistake. And then I tried to elbow his head off his shoulder. I didn't like, I'm a 49 year old man and I'm still behaving in a way that's childish. Well, I learned something about myself there. And then the other thing is um, uh, fortitude. You know, if you're being choked, you think you're, you want to tap, but you realize blood's getting to my brain. I can breathe, I'm, I'm uncomfortable, but that's okay. And I have to make really small adjustments and I have to try to get out of this position. All right, I get my bell rung and um, okay, that's okay. Just move to the right and I'll get it. I'll get my, my mind's coming back. You know, the, you get, we get our businesses, get their bells rung. Our businesses fail. Our families fall apart. Our spouses leave us. Oh, this is all very painful stuff, uncomfortable stuff. Our child gets a, the worst imaginable thing, gets an illness or dies in an accident. These are all horrible things. But what martial arts train us is the, it's, it's practice. And, and, and um, it, first of all, it shows us the weaknesses in our character. Um, and I know um, I'm working on my memoir right now and it's called Rocky Soil. I was an atheist until my thirties. Now I'm a Christian, but I still fear that I'm, I'm that soil in the parable that the seed fell on that's rocky that will never grow. It will just never grow. Well, I think martial arts is, is what helps me learn like yesterday I get elbowed in the head and then I respond by trying to take the guy's head off. That's very childish behavior for a grown man. <laughs> uh, and, but would I know that about myself if I didn't train in martial arts that I'm still wrestling with my character. I'm still wrestling to be virtuous. So that's, what's just great about it all that um, it gives us humility. We get to know who we are. Like we can't, I can pretend I'm the world's best writer. There's no, no one, you know, there's, I can pretend I'm the world's best filmmaker, but I can blame Hollywood and this and that. And I'd be the best, but for this, I'd be the best, but for that. But, you know, I go and so let's say I go to box. It doesn't matter what I thought about myself the moment I step in the ring. And, you know, some 19 year old kid drops me with a liver shot 20 seconds in, the truth has been revealed to me, you know? Um, so how wonderful is that? And, uh, and then once, and what you know, whenever you've seen like your tribe here that have been doing martial arts their whole life, they have been, ex they've been, they, you know, we all know those guys that show up, they're very fit. Um, they think they know something and then they get tapped out or knocked out or, or they just get smoked and you'll never, never see them again. You know it when you see them, these guys will never, never come back again. Shihan Bobby Lowe used to do that when big, you know, I was in, arm, in the army when I was training there. But you'd see soldiers come in or Marines come in and he'd put them up against like five foot two, uh, you know, 60 year old guy. And they would get dropped by a five foot two, 60 year old guy. And it's a 19 year old Marine who was throwing mm. his, you know, who's big and strong and was throwing it around. Well, that guy never, 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 never came back. What a shame. Because yeah. the one thing that big, strong young man needed to learn was thoughtfulness and humility. He missed the chance. So oh. that's what I love about it. And then admiration. We get to be around great martial artists and just look at them, watch them train with us. And, and or a young person you see with just great natural gifts and abilities and talents. I just get to watch them flower and blossom. That kid that comes in, he's awkward. And you think there's no hope for him. Oh. And then... A year later, you're like, where did this guy come from? I remember last year, a guy couldn't even, you know, throw a punch. And now who is this kid? Uh, that is awesome. So learning admiration of greatness, learning humility, learning just because you're in pain doesn't mean you quit. Uh, and then while we all dojo kun, all of the mythos of the martial arts, it all really comes down to the same thing serve the vulnerable and the vulnerable are not weak they're strong people placed in impossible situations right in all those movies it'd be a a very strong woman who ran a dumpling shop and the mafia comes and she's a strong hard-working woman with a little dumpling shop and then the mob comes and tries to shake her down and her son can't do anything and then you know then next thing you know he's just you know he gets 
Sifu, he's training, he's strong, and now he can stand with his vulnerable mother, his vulnerable community. Not that they were weak, but that was, what's a strong woman gonna do who's running her dumpling shop against the mob? Okay, that's what it's about. Recognizing the vulnerable are stronger than us so many times. They're impossible situations. And we have been privileged and blessed with the martial arts. And it is most of the times we're not going to be fighting physically, but I can tell you that with my work in Iraq and I've had tea with Al Qaeda in Sudan in the midst of the genocides there and was a mile away from ISIS when I was documenting the war in, in, in Iraq. Um, and there was no way I could have done that without martial arts because, um, oh, there I am <laughs> uh, <laughs> in the military. There's no way I could have done that without a lifetime of, of having to check my fear. Mm. Wow, there's a lot of stories going on behind the stories. Um, Sonny, I know that uh, you've got some questions and I'd like to turn it over now, Sonny, you give, give me some questions because I uh, give you a chance to, I know some people have been writing you on comments. Uh, Sonny, go ahead. Yes. All right, Sifu, thank you. Uh, well, so far it is going, I love this interview. I, I really do, Jason. I mean, things that are coming out of your mouth, I mean, it just hits home because that's one of the reasons why I started martial art was because I came from a divorced family too, where my dad was a little bit off, but <laughs> he was a good man, but a little off. And my mom was a strong person and she was the one who actually forced me into it. And I didn't really want to do it, but I'm so happy and grateful now that she did force me into it. And here I am now. So one of the questions that uh, I'll give you a couple of questions. The first question is um, you not graduating from high school, you know, what is your success formula for where you where you are now? You know, how did you become where you are now? Because some people think that they need a great education and yes, a great education is, is good for you, but at the same time, it's what you do with that education afterwards. So what is your success formula? Well, I'm, I'm really glad for that question because mm -hmm. I think a lot of us in the martial arts probably have also the similarity of dysfunctional families, ADHD, whatever that is. I say it's a superpower. What, I, I have it. I tell young kids with it, you're a Ferrari in a land of Yugos. Thank God for that. And I, and I found out in the military that I, I have dyslexia. So martial arts and sports is where I excelled and um, school, not so much. When I got into the, I mean, I should say not so much. I was last in my class out of 565 kids before I dropped out. So mm -hmm. not at all. Um, but I ended up going to Leeward Community College when I got out of the army in Hawaii, which was, I went in the best time when all the plantations closed. So there were all these men that were old, you know, like in their late thirties and forties, you know, younger <laughs> than I am now. But to me, there were these old wise men that I got to listen to their stories and, and, and learn from them. That was a blessing. And then I, you know, I always read martial arts, by the way, was the beginning black belt magazine and books like this and all the O'Hara publications and, and then wanting to learn about China and Japan and the Shaolin temple and this and that my love for reading was birthed by martial arts. I never checked mm. that. So I, I think a formal education is not necessary. Um, but I do think that just because you didn't succeed in high school, I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I have graduate education now. I couldn't succeed in a high school right now, period. There's just no way. If you send me to a high school right now, I wouldn't pass a single class. Although I was an A student in college because there's just no way I could sit down, listen to a bell, go to another room, sit down. This is never going to happen. And yes. I think it's a shame that that so many young kids, young kids who are very bright um, are turned off from education because the way it was delivered to them was not suited for them. 
And so I would say I was very insecure because I thought everyone looked at me and thought I was poor white trash. I thought everyone, I thought I was dumb. Um, and uh, so I think now I look back and how silly it is that I let the world tell me these things about myself. I wrote my book, I was given an award that I received at Yale <laughs> from the wow. political philosophy department. And I, I, the whole time I kept telling myself, you have a GED from the state of Georgia and here you are. <laughs> and to think how addled, that I still am to be honest, I still am addled by a lot of these insecurities, but I, I just learned not to care and just pursue knowledge because of my desire to serve. And then I realized that when, a mentor of mine said, a state representative, Mark Moses, who recently passed away from lupus, who is one of the most beautiful humans I ever met, former Marine. He said, Jason, when people look down their nose at you, it makes it so much easier to pull them along by their nose. <laughs> and so I, I learned not to care um, what people think about me and my education, my level of education. Um, mm -hmm. And then to feel sorry for them really that they let superficial things and then also for those of us who had gone on to get an education, that shouldn't blind us to that there are geniuses out there um, that are coming across our southern border right now, uh, hoping to get jobs as day laborers. But they're, they're sharp as tax. They have an IQ higher than I would ever hope to have. They have an ability to learn things. And, and so not to let the world, who cares what it thinks about us, and, and maybe even more importantly, let it not form how we think of others. Again, that comes with the ability to learn how to ad admire greatness and, and beauty in others. Um, and the formal titles or degrees, really. I tell people, you know, your college degree tells me that you're more about your socioeconomic background and your parents than it does you. Hmm. And I tell troubled youth, that I deal with, you know, when I, when I see a 17 year old, I can't see them because all I see is their environment and their parents. For me to know who you are, come back in 20 years. <laughs> your kids. Yes, definitely. For sure. No, that's, that's terrific. I mean, uh, it's one of the lessons that CQL has always taught me, you know, it's, it's n not what everybody says to you. It's what you say to yourself, which is really, really important. That's what it comes down to. And hopefully it's good things so that you can share and give to the world, uh, give it back. You could say pay it forward. Okay. Uh, the next question I actually have comes from my wife, my beautiful wife. She, she is, um, she wants to ask you, you know, you're uh, a, a, an award-winning film p producer, uh, director, everything, and human rights uh, activist. How would someone go about in doing what you're doing so that, you know, instead of just saying, uh, I'm going to do it. What are kind of the steps to maybe do more to help people like uh, uh, trafficking, right? Um, and, and that my wife is really uh, passionate about it. And so she wants to maybe do more than just making posts on Facebook or Instagram and stuff. What other steps can she maybe look into to try to do more or what anybody else can do more uh, to maybe make this world better? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think we all want to serve and we don't know where to begin. I'd say begin, look at the problems closest to home and mm -hmm. find the groups that are working hard, doing the best they can. Uh, so um, like for example, in Hawaii, trafficking is a big problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Homelessness is a big problem. And we don't know where to begin. And to know it's, it's a very sorrowful, to share the burdens of the vulnerable makes you vulnerable. And you need to know that uh, going into it. Um, so I would say look for organizations in your community addressing the problems close to home. Even in my work, I always start close to home and people go, well, you're, 
working a lot in Sudan. You're working a lot in Iraq. I've been working with Iraqis since the 90s, but my work there really began close to home. Being from Chicago, I grew up with a lot of Chaldeans and Assyrians. Studying war and genocide and democide leading up to the US invasion, I knew it would lead to genocide because we would shatter order that we would not be able to, to replace. And so it started close to home for me because it was my experiences in the military, my relationships in my community, and, and my ability to influence there. So I'd say start um, close to home, mm -hmm. find people that are already there and trust them. You know, I do a lot of work with our neighbors without homes and we were in LA and I had a reporter following my, my employees around because we had an office at Hollywood and Vine at the Hollywood and Vine building and we would serve our neighbors without homes. And we made these backpacks, we make these backpacks that say, I am made in the image of God. Well, there were these two new guys that moved there and I didn't know them. So I sat down and I asked them matter of factly, yeah, hey guys, uh, where are you from? Oh, they're at Houston. I'm like, what are your bench warrants for? And she got really the reporter, like said, you can't ask that question. And I, and then they shared with me what their bench warrants were for. I'm like, so what are you guys struggling with? Is it heroin or meth? And this reporter was becoming incensed. Mm -hmm. But by the end of the day, she thanked me for that because of course we wanted to help these guys get their bench warrants removed. Or mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure they did, weren't dangerous to our other neighbors without homes. It was important yes. for us to know what they were struggling with, build that relationship. And so a lot of times when you're working uh, in, in, in a lot of these serving vulnerable communities, it can be a little jarring. We go there kind of naive. So trust the people that have been there for any length of time, because it's hard. Prison ministry, which is important. I think everyone should try to do that. It's hard. It's not... Yes. It's going to break your heart. Serving your neighbors without homes is going to break your heart. And trafficking, oh, yeah. So it, 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 again, it's the martial arts. Like, don't just show up. If you're going to do it, you got to know this is not going to be pleasant. It's going to, it's going to um, be very sorrowful. But that's what it is to share someone else's suffering, right? So that's my advice. Start close to home. No, that, that's great advice. I mean, wow. Uh, one of the other questions that I have was uh, uh, someone was watching one of your videos. Uh, can you tell us about uh, the promise? Um, it, I guess it's dealing with uh, pro-life and everything. So, sorry, my son. <laughs> All right. Uh, but he wanted, they want to know about... Uh, your when you do your talks about the promise that you want people to recite i, I mean I, I love that promise really well so yeah this is where we get into like a very sensitive topic for a lot of people and and um so i apologize for anyone if i'm reminding you of a your own personal tragedy but for me i joined the army when i was 17 because my high school girlfriend was pregnant and we both wanted to keep the baby we were naive we should have put the baby up for adoption if anyone knew us that was sensible that would have been their advice but we didn't tell anyone actually she hid that she was pregnant and i went down to the recruiter's office and while i was in basic training in the third trimester her father found out she was pregnant and forced her to have a third trimester abortion and uh you know i was a kid naive kid i didn't know what abortion was believe it or not and i did not know that it was legal it just struck me as the strangest thing that you could do this to a child in the third trimester um so i had promised her that i'm going to tell people that this is legal i thought people didn't even know it was legal so when i got to hawaii i'd go door to door um i'd go door to door just telling you know the filipino migrant workers outside of Schofield Barracks that abortion was legal. That was what I would do on my free time. And that's, as a 17 year old, that's how my whole journey began. Um, but I speak to high school students and it actually came from when I was a student at uh, actually HCC. I went to Leeward and HCC, but I was, at eight, I was at HCC. I was in a class with Kim Pine's father, for those of you who Kim Pine is. I, I took his logic class, Kim just ran for mayor, but uh, I had a logic class. These three girls kept throwing paper at the back of my head. And they said, shut up, Holly boy. Like, 
stop talking about abortion all the time. I would bring up abortion in every class and then whip paper at the back of my head. And it's very embarrassing to have, you know, girls throw paper at your head. So I turned around and I said, listen, I'll never talk about abortion again. You just have to promise me you'll never have an abortion. And uh, the two girls said it real quick. I'll, I'll never have an abortion. I'll shut up. And the third girl, she wouldn't answer me. And I said, one out of three women go through this horrible thing. It's going to be you. Please promise me. And I will never talk about abortion. So about five years later, I had just graduated from the University of Hawaii. I was working at Chuck Steakhouse above Dukes, the outrigger Waikiki. And I was walking to work and I hear, Howie boy. And it was that girl. She was beautiful. Um, Kamehameha grad, like I would cast her for a movie. She, you know, she just had this elegance and grace. No, I'd never forget her. She said, do you remember me? I said, of course. She says, you remember the promise that you had me make? I said, I do. And she goes, you know, you never kept your end of the deal. You kept running your mouth about abortion all semester after that. I said, oh, I'm sorry. She said, well, the next semester I got pregnant and I wanted to keep the baby, but my mother, my boyfriend and my boyfriend's mother were pressuring me to get an abortion, actually forced me in the car and drove me to Planned Parenthood. And I just kept remembering the promise. And when I got there, and when the door opened, I ran and I ran and I ran and I caught the bus home and she turned to her son and she said, meet the promise, meet your promise. <laughs> and um, to like, look at this boy. So now when I speak to high schools and colleges, it causes controversy, you know. I ask the students to promise me, the young men to promise me they will never coerce, threaten, bully, because they find 70% uh, of women who've had abortions say they felt pressured by a man into the decision. So I asked them to promise they would never force a young woman to do that, if they could make that promise to stand up. Uh, and that, so that all was birthed that in Logic 101 in Dr. Pine's class, when three girls were whipping paper at the back of my head. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's no. awesome. Yeah, those are that. That's a great promise to actually make everybody do. Because myself personally, I, I am pro life, and um, you know, it's it's <laughs> just hard to even think about it and stuff. But uh, at the same time, I believe everybody should still at least make that promise because life is precious, right? Eh. <laughs> sorry you're getting teary I know and can I say I know you have so many German followers so as part of that promise a friend of mine who his name is Patrick Nuo he's a Swiss pop star um yeah. and we wanted to make a movie together and we partnered with Justin Bieber's mother Patty Millette and we wanted to make a short film that celebrated mothers and human dignity and Patrick said you know Hollywood acts as if Germany only existed from 1933 to 1945. Can we make a movie to show the beauty of Germany and uh, the German people? And, and so we made this little film, it's called Crescendo, it's in German. Um, and the German is perfect unless you actually speak German and you'll notice, is that German they're speaking? But if you're not a German, you'll, you'll think it's German. Some of the actors are German, others are not, but they're doing their best but we wanted to do it in German and we had to make the decision, do we do it in German? And Germans will go, huh, to parts of it, but yet it seems authentic to the story. Or do we do it in English and the whole world goes, what? So we did it in German. And of course, some of the actors, their German is flawless because they're German. Um, the main character who is perfect for the role is Colombian and she took a voice coach. Uh, she had a voice coach for six months um, an accent coach even. She wanted to get the regional accent correct. So you can tell us how well we did. But if you're from Germany, it's called Crescendo. It's on YouTube. It's a short film. And it won like 36 major Hollywood film festivals. But it was birthed kind of from the promise, our desire to celebrate mothers and their courage, and also to tell a story about Germany that, um, that wasn't set from 1933 to 1945. It'd be as if in America, every movie we make was set from like 1860 to 1864, right? It would be not great. So, um, yeah, so I just thought I'd share that. 
No, oh, that's terrific. Go ahead, Sipu. No, no, I mean, that's interesting that you did something in German, crescendo. Um, yes. Yeah, um, it's, and you said it's on YouTube? And we wanted to give it to the world for free. We made it with Justin Bieber's mother, Patty, and we used all the revenue. We threw events all over the country and raised $6 million for women's shelters. Wow. And pregnancy centers, yeah, to help women in need. And that's because Patty was pregnant with Justin as a teenager. She'd attempted suicide. She was in a very bad place. And Justin actually lived the first six months of his life in a pregnancy center. Wow. Yes. So hmm. We made that little film, but it's in, in German. And that was really inspired by Patrick Nuo. Um, I don't know how many of your, your German, uh, how many of the folks in Germany would know Patrick, but if you, you Google him, some of his music videos have millions of views. And he was a judge in Germany, survivor, Germany idol, things like that. Great. Okay, we can we can take one more question. Um, you, uh, um, you have one more, uh, Sonny? Uh, let me, sorry, I'm just going through it right now. Hold on. Um, all right. Yes, next question would be, um, what made you go into the film industry and how or what would what advice would you give for someone who wants to get into the film industry? Okay, I love this question. Um, uh, I started knocking on doors and uh, then started doing radio shows, then I had a radio show. And I thought, how can I tell stories um, to the whole world? And I realized movies would be the best way. Maybe now if I were young, I would wanna do TikTok or Instagram or something, I don't know. <laughs> But for our generation, it was movies. My first film was a documentary. My first narrative feature film was Bella, which won the Toronto Film Festival. I can say that I fell into the movie business for a little too long. And I'm sure Sifu knows a lot about this and Mark knows a lot about this. And I got lost in sort of like financing and budgets and this, and I forgot. And I, I felt, I never loved film. It was just had a utility to it. I didn't like making films. I liked having made films and being part of the process or, or having distributed a film. Which I've distributed over 50, um, only been a producer on about 10. But then I reminded myself, no, I just tell stories. I wanna tell beautiful stories. And this is part of it. The business is part of it, but don't let it become all of it. So never forget what you're doing is you wanna tell beautiful stories to enrich and inspire people's lives. If you forget that, which you will from time to time, because it, it's, it's tough, it's a tough business. I say it's equivalent in business to what hitting a, a fast pitch in Major League Baseball is. Even the best people only succeed three out of 10 times. You know, it's tough, um, but you're doing it to make something like when we made Crescendo, we wanted to make a short film that people would watch for the rest of human history. That was our modest goal. Um, so fall in love with telling stories Use Instagram and TikTok to begin telling stories. Um, write, write, write. You know, at first I would say write, direct, produce shorts, whether it's for YouTube, TikTok, or for festivals. Um, there are so many great resources on YouTube. The best and the brightest, the most successful people in the film business, they want to tell you how to do it. Listen to them. Also, Masterclass. Masterclass.com is wonderful. And because my degrees in political science didn't come from film school, I had to be self-taught. Um, but I'm glad that I never thought I knew. I think maybe if I went to film school, I was like, oh, I learned how to do it, now let's do it. I still feel like I don't know, and I don't. I don't know how to finance a film. I don't know how to produce a film. I don't know how to market a film. And how could I know? It keeps changing. The technology changes. Where you distribute, how you distribute changes every day. How you market changes. My first film, we didn't have social media. Now you can't market a film without, that's the biggest part of it, right? And tomorrow it's gonna to be the next thing. So no, you don't know, and no, anyone can do it. Anyone can tell a story. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I would say start small. Again, find a young writer, director, producer in your network and serve them. And if, mm -hmm. if your passion is writing, find a young director in your community and say, hey, I wrote the script you can have it, you know, and start with shorts. I love shorts. 
To me, shorts is mm -hmm. like poetry. It's like haiku. How can mm -hmm. you tell a full story in a shorter amount of time as possible? And like my movie Crescendo, if that were a feature film, it would cost me $40 million. It cost almost a million dollars to do the 14 minute film. Um, I would never be able to, at that point in my career, have that kind of a budget, that kind of production quality for a feature film. But we got to shoot at Universal Studios, on film, um, a period piece as a short film. And I would say, again, this goes back to like me being a high school dropout, not feeling qualified. I have friends that went to NYU that were born into the industry that are still working in Hollywood as tutors and then fighting to, to make their career. But those are the people I respect because they mean it, they believe it, they love it. Know that this might not be how you feed your family. Some, you know, you might have to do other things, but that doesn't mean you don't do it. You know, I'm at the point now, I love making films so much that I don't worry about success. Um, I'm just gonna do it. This story has to be told. Mel Gibson said that behind every movie, uh, behind every bad movie is a lunatic that wouldn't quit till it was made. In other words, you gotta be crazy to get a movie made. It's that hard. <laughs> and the average film takes seven years. Average, seven. James Cameron took him 20 to do um, Avatar after Titanic. You think after Titanic, he could write a blank check, do whatever he wants. Scorsese Ooh. took him, um, 30 years to do silence, maybe Ooh. more. So just, yeah, fortitude, fall in love with the process, fall in love with writing, fall in love with creating pitch decks and finding out how to approach investors. Oh, this is the other key. Know that filmmaking is storytelling at every point. To get your investors, you got to tell a story. <laughs> awesome. Right? You got to awesome. be able to sell it. That's the storytelling. Yeah. So don't yeah. think I got to pitch investors go. That's the first story I got to tell. I got to pitch it. I got to make them cry at the your Roots Chris Steakhouse. And I got this guy across from me. I'm going to make him, I'm going to tell him the script. He's going to cry. Yeah. And then you got to make the movie. That's the story. Then you got to market the film. You're on Good Morning America. Now you're telling a story because you need people to go buy your tickets or to download. So fall in mm -hmm. love with storytelling and know why you're telling stories. We're, st we're storytelling animals. Yes. And we're, at, we're creatures filled vessels of sorrow. The world is filled with vessels of sorrow. Each person you see is adult. <laughs> and we want to elevate them, inspire them, uplift them, take a little bit of sorrow out and pour a little joy in. That's why we tell stories. <laughs> um, yeah. Once you know that, you will succeed. You know, we're not all going to have Hollywood mansions. Um, but that's not why I'm in it. Uh, my mentor is a, one of the biggest producers in Hollywood. And the first thing he does is rip people down, tell them they're talentless, <laughs> tell them they'll never make it, go back to uh, Ohio and sell furniture for your dad and stop wasting everyone's time. He's just really tough. But it reminds me of those old Kung Fu movies, right? Like you got to stand outside the Shaolin <laughs> Temple, you know, with the vase on your head. And I, and I said, why do you do that? And it's kind of like that. He said, if they can't take an insult from me, their first day in Hollywood, that it breaks them and they leave. I just saved them several years of their life because they sooner or later were going to quit anyway. Hmm. They need to learn how to take failure. They need to learn, you know, and I, I always tell young people, if you're not willing to wait tables for 10 years, don't come to town. You don't even deserve it. You don't even deserve the privilege to make movies if you're not willing to wait tables for 10 years. Heck, I'm still one. I mean, I'm 49 years old and waiting tables is one of only three things I know how to do to make money. So it's, it's always an option for me. Um, but I will do that to tell stories. I will do whatever I have to do to feed my family so I can keep telling stories. I don't know wow. if that's a coherent answer. I might have just <laughs> undermined my whole point by telling an incoherent story. <laughs> no, no. That, no, I, it, it, it's, a <laughs> that is a great answer. Well, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Jason, we've had a really great time listening to you. And I'm sure that people that's listening to you, you know, have got some inspiration and motivation, you know, and I want to make sure that um, this, this um, conference or talk that we had with you doesn't go to waste. And, you know, I took down notes about what it is and 
how it is with you and I really enjoy it. So, um, you know, Sonny, I'm gonna let you have the last word and then, uh, and then um, have um, Jason say his farewell to us. And so that maybe perhaps in the future we can schedule another one because um, I'm sure after this in here, you know, there's gonna be a lot of questions that's gonna be, uh, you know, having to be answered. So go ahead, Sonny. Yes, well, thank you, Sifu. Again, Jason, really, really thank you for uh, doing this for Sifu Wow because, you know, it, it was just amazing. I learned many things. And one of the key things that I did uh, write down was um, facts tell, stories sell, because you have to sell your story to, to be able to do the things some, uh, uh, that you do now. And, and I do believe in that too, as well, is because to tell a good story can only inspire and help people, right? Uh, so again, thank you everyone for joining us in this Beyond Kicking and Punching podcast with Sifu Al Dacascos. Just to remind you guys that Sifu Al does have a website. It's called dacascosmartialarts.com. Uh, we will actually be posting the recording or replay of this podcast on that site, as well as his products will be on there and his book order. You can do that on amazon.com. The name of your book again, Sifu? Legacy just, Through the Eyes of a Warrior. <laughs> good. Just putting you on the spot, Sifu, making sure you All know right. your own book. And then also Jason has a, a book out too as well, which we would highly recommend as well. The name of the book, Jason? I the, race know it, to save our, the Race to Save Our Century, and you can find it at our website, thegreatcampaign.org, or wherever you buy books. There you awesome. go. Uh, also, just letting everybody know we're reamping our DTS program. That's the reason why we're uh, there's a little bit of a delay on it, but it's going to be terrific. It's going to be awesome because you know that Sifu Al is awesome. That's one of the biggest reasons why I traveled everywhere just to meet up with him because I know he's well worth learning from. And so if you're looking into learning a few things, the best part of it now is you can do it also online, okay? But I would highly recommend to actually visit him in Hawaii because Hawaii is so beautiful, you know, why wouldn't you wanna train on the beach or in the park with Sifu Al? So again, thank you for joining us. And so Jason, I'm gonna give you the final words and then after that i'm gonna open up to the gallery for people to just say hello say thank you wave our usual uh uh goodbyes go ahead jason well first of all i just want to say um it's been a privilege to to spend time with you sunny and sifu and, and your friends um uh, another one of my mentors has this great saying you judge a man by his, his children and i watched a Mark's uh, program last week with you, Sifu and Sonny, and he's such a strong, kind, gentle man. He just emanates nobility and, and, and beauty of soul, magnanimity. And he is what you would hope martial arts produces, a, a man like that. So it, it, watching that interview told me not only about Mark, but Sifu about you and, and, and Malia. So uh, I just want to thank you for this program. And I hope, I hope you keep doing shows because I'm going to watch every episode with all of your heroes. And I know so many of you here are, you run dojos and you know, um, your pillars in your community as martial artists, especially those of you who teach. I break martial, people who do martial arts down into three categories, warriors, gladiators, and martial artists. Gladiators are people who do it to compete, maybe for prize money. And that still is a noble thing because they inspire people, they're heroes. Warriors are police officers and firemen, soldiers, uh, they do martial arts for reasons of matters of life and death to preserve and protect their community. But martial artists are those who, who master an art to preserve it, to share it, to pass it on. And you are the ones that train the warriors. You are the one that train the gladiators. When I was a boy, I don't know if you remember the Sunny, your mom made you do martial arts. I really couldn't do it as much as I wanted. The yellow pages were the door 
doorway to enchantment for me. I would just look at all the dojos and I, all these different yes. martial arts and I would ride my bike past them and just look in or sneak in. And, and it was like a doorway to a magical world. And then when I was finally able to start training regularly in junior high, it was like I was entering the world of heroes. And that's what this audience does is it your martial artists that you're passing on um, what you were given and you are, you know, truly pillars in your community. And one thing I would ask, if you see a boy who rides his bike all the time and is always peeking in and he's dirty and he has cowlicks and maybe not wearing shoes, find a way to train that kid for free. <laughs> um, I don't know how you can do that and get his mom in there to sign the waiver because I was that boy. And, um, and they need those, those kids need you more than anyone probably. Uh, and they'll probably, um, be your greatest students one day. But yeah, I just want to thank all of you for what you do and Sifu for what you're doing and Sunny in your community. And I can't wait to come back. We're shooting a film in Hawaii uh, at the end of the year. So I hope to put all of you in there. It's a Christmas film. Great. Uh, set in Hawaii. I'm there, I'm there. just uh, send me the date. And my wife is also going, <laughs> I'm background. <laughs> oh, I can't wait to pitch you guys the story. It's, uh, you're gonna love it. It's, um, it's uh, a Christmas story set within our homeless Micronesian community. That's your hint. Uh, we don't okay, even, we got it, that. It's a done deal. <laughs> All right. All right. Okay. Well, all right. Thank, thank um, you very much again, guys. Can you guys all do me a favor? Can you guys all unmute yourselves? So this way you can say hello to Jason personally as well as give them a thank you for doing this awesome interview. Oh. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Jason, okay, you guys, oh unhitch, unhitch your, 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 uh, your mute. And your mute. Yeah. There oh, we go. Mute. Come on, Lily. Un unmute. I see you, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> Lily, wake up. Everybody, unmute <laughs> yourselves, please. <laughs> Here this we is go. your chance to say hello. All right. Hey, guys. I really enjoy you folks being here. Let's everybody just give a good old clap. Come on. Let's clap. Clap up. Come on, Lily. Wake up there. Give me a clap there. <laughs> hey, Jason. Right. Nice to meet you. Eh? Maybe next time directly, eh? not over the computer. Huh? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Too, Great right? interview. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll all meet in Hawaii. Yes. <laughs> yeah. There you go. This is a great we idea. We are actually having a conference in Hawaii soon for everybody. <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Take that, care, guys. All right, guys. We'll, we'll see you guys later. We hope you folks uh, enjoy the program. And if you did, you know, just leave your comments and then we'll get back to you for sure. All right, Thank aloha you. from Hawaii and take care of yourself and God bless and stay safe. Put your mask on. And if you're in the house, throw it away. You don't need it. Okay, love you guys. <laughs> bye bye. Bye, everybody. Bye, Jason. Bye. 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 Stay safe. Good day, everyone. Yeah. <laughs>